Hi everyone, welcome. I am, my name is Alison Dittman. I am the incoming president of Foresight Institute and I'm really, really happy to welcome you for a fantastic salon today for the first one of the now weekly global online salons that are hosted by Foresight. Uh, this is the next iteration after we've met for on a daily basis for 10 weeks. Uh, so I'm really, really happy to see so many familiar faces uh, back in the game. And I'm hoping that we can really pick it off and where we left it off with it, uh, which is to say with a bang, I'm really happy to have three really fantastic contributors um, to the Fossa community uh, like on online today with me here. And uh, actually, um, I think two of them at least have been on in uh, previously to talk about COVID-19 and now I'm really happy to have them here talking about um, uh, um, a recent book that uh, Roman and I co-edited on artificial superintelligence, coordination and strategy. So to provide for those who are new, um, to provide a little bit of feedback or like a, a context maybe for you, um, Foresight advances technologies for the long-term benefit of life. Uh, and we use three strategies. Um, we use science and technology education in online salons like this, uh, or we need in person to do that uh, in times of uh, no crisis. Um, so that's one. So we try to educate um, and try to make sense with this community that is uh, quite technically um, literate. And so it's, it's been really, really great fun over the past few months. The second thing we're trying to do is trying to advance specific areas of high impact science and technology with specific technical competitions. So you can think of those as uh, a hackathon uh, where folks get together to try to use mostly molecular, like work toward molecular precision and uh, to solving different uh, problems, mostly uh, in, the, uh, in the topics of health, uh, and climate, but we're also uh, expanding outward in that area. And we're going to announce uh, one upcoming technical competition, this time online, for later this year soon. And then thirdly, uh, we do have a more, let's say, private strategy groups that coordinate on specific topics of interest around technology development. Um, and so we have one uh, that's on crypto, and then there's one on health extension that we're launching next week. So if you want to join that, let me know. But then there's also the recurring annual AGI strategy meeting that we have now been doing for four years in a row. I'm really happy to actually see a lot of folks that were at that meeting here. So um, welcome to all of you. Um, so the meetings were started uh, with the observation that um, initially timelines of a few folks were shortening and we're like, okay, we should get together and uh, pan and, and sketch out what that means for different policy, um, for different policy proposals. So we got together and uh, that was four years ago, um, and did po different policy scenarios for different timelines. Um, then uh, uh, three years ago, we had a follow-up uh, strategy meeting that focused specifically on artificial general intelligence and the coordination of great powers, such as China and the US. Uh, last year, we had a coordination meeting that focused specifically on paths to cooperation, uh, both on a geopolitical level around AI, but also uh, within the AI safety community and within the AI community. How can we get more cooperation off the ground? And then this year we had one on diversifying and extending the um, uh, AI and AI safety community to include a lot of other a lot of other actors that are important to get AI or like the path to more and more advanced AI systems right, even if they may not be working directly on AI. So those, this is kind of a recap of, uh, of those kind of like strategy meetings that we've done. And it was a great pleasure to at one of them meet Roman Jampolski, um, who has been a Foresight Fellow in um, Computer Security and AGI for a while now, uh, and um, who has attended one of those AGI corporation uh, meetings in the past. Uh, and then based on that meeting, and because there was quite a significant um, amount of interest uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be developing the topic further, um, he uh, then co-edited a special edition uh, for the uh, Big Data and Cognitive Computing Journal, um, and um, specifically focused on AI coordination uh, and great powers. And he asked me to uh, co-edit that issue with him, which uh, I obviously accepted. So thank you so much, uh, Roman, for doing such a fantastic job and uh, and getting that uh, and getting this issue and uh, getting that issue out. Um, that issue then became so successful, uh, or at least there was uh, so much interest generated by the issue that it and then turned into a book. Um, and so the book uh, is what we're going to be discussing today, and it is about artificial superintelligence, um, coordination, um, and strategy. And um, I think the reason why it, it garnered uh, a lot of attention and, uh, and why that. Uh, why uh, the journal was quite pleased was because we have really, really, really fantastic contributions to chapters 
And um, I already said we had a few of them already on put on different topics. So uh, what's interesting about the chapter contribution is that the folks who contributed chapter are really so wide ranging that uh, they have spoken on a variety of different topics in the FOSA community. So I'm super excited to uh, be introducing them to you uh, over the next few salons. And uh, today we will be joined by Nell Watson on um, a super mall AI, uh, AI as, the fountain, uh, as a fountain of values and um, by David Mannheim who will be talking specifically uh, about the failure modes for, um, for multi-agent dynamics. So I'm very happy to do that uh, just in a second. I think, you know, to provide a little bit of, uh, in, of um, I guess, like context on why coordination and why AI coordination is uh, so hard and so important to get right. Um, you know, I think um, for those who are, not, uh, who are not in that field, um, you know, intelligence is really like the one thing uh, that gives us most of the things that we care about, right, uh, in, in our modern lives, right? And so it's the biggest multiplying factor for all of those. And because it is so powerful and desirable, there are also big risks associated with uh, developing it smoothly, right? And uh, given those big upsides and downs uh, and, and, and downsides, um, I think it, it is really like, a path to advance super intelligence should really be humanity's uh, on on the top priorities of humanity's goal list, right? And I think there's a variety of different concerns, um, and there's an incredibly rich community that is working on specifics there. But all, the concerns range all the way from long-term normative questions around which goals uh, are good goals to be exemplified by AI agents, and to technical questions concerning how to actually align artificial agents uh, with any goals that humans may have, and then to quite uh, near-term questions of how to create an ecosystem in which we have coordination to really ensure that we find better rather than worse solutions to the different sub-problems, um, because those are really difficult, difficult problems to solve. Um, and how can we avoid that instead um, AI doesn't generate um, much violence uh, amongst those who produce it and amongst those who govern it. So uh, the book touches on a variety of different uh, kind of like subfields in that area. Um, and I'm really happy to have uh, to at least give like a little bit of an outlook uh, today in, in those areas. Um, I think, you know, as we say uh, in the kind of like introduction to the book, uh, maybe to onboard a few folks who um, don't really know exactly what AI coordination is specifically about and why it's important. On the one hand, AI coordination has really big multiplier effects. So. Uh, you could say that given the difficulty of the challenges around building safe AI, right, which are ethical, technical, computer security, and so on, we really ought to ensure uh, that the required time horizon is really available to develop thorough solutions. Right? So coordination efforts, they could allow actors we develop to, uh, to develop AI to slow down when necessary, rather than uh, engage in adversarial races, uh, which may lead to corner cutting on really important safety issues. Right. It's also uh, important to um, talk about AI coordination um, because of kind of prag pragmatism, right? Um, many of the kind of issues that I mentioned before, um, they are problems that are already important and we can already make headway on, but some of them become even more important further down the line. Uh, and coordination is something, while, in, while in it, it in itself is incredibly, uh, incredibly helping to solve, it is at least something that we have historical context for and uh, some historical experience in dealing with. So coordination around issues that um, uh, relate to AI governance and AI de development are something that we can already make headway on because it's something that we're already doing, right? We're already co coordinating on a global and even on a local level. So it's something that we have some data points on and is something that we can make headway on right now. Then it's also getting more and more urgent, right? So I think with real race dynamics, um, right, across major powers, um, slowly emerging, not only in AI and more advanced AI, but really across the board, right, uh, especially in the context of, of China and the US, but really, um, I think, in a, in a much more global context, right, coordination has a really high, um, high urgency um, to, to allow us to uh, make, make space for better and for better solutions to be developed. Right, and currently, really, there is this kind of like small and ever uh, like a small window of opportunity to push for more coordination, and that window uh, of obviously getting smaller and smaller and more and more urgent, uh, as we can see with different crisis scenarios like the COVID nineteen crisis currently popping up. Right, um, coordination is something that is much easier to be addressed, especially amongst great uh, powers, but also really on a local level. Right, um, if it's addressed before a crisis hit, hits and not uh, and not after the fact. So there is a ton of kind of risk and opportunity uh, in those areas. And um, I'm really hoping that 
on the long run, one of the major ups of getting coordination right is that, especially around AI safety, is that it doesn't only help AI safety, right? If we were able to coordinate much better on a global and local level, it doesn't only solve a bunch of problems that we care about within, within AI and AI safety, but ultimately uh, it is a problem that um, pertains to every uh, kind of like coordin every coordination or governance uh, issue around technologies, whether it be biotechnology, whether it be computer security, uh, whether it be a host of different things, climate destabilization, like the ultimate uh, intergenerational and global prisoners dilemma, I think as it's often called. So um, that, like, the upsides for getting coordination right is uh, really, really high. And, you know, there may, um, there may be ways in which we can solve um, you know, um, those issues not only for one potential existential risk, but for multiple ones, and uh, kind of and render a society and a, a global civilization that is much more resilient uh, against a variety of different future risks, some of which we may not even know about yet. And I think as we've seen with uh, with the current pandemic, right, like there are many risks that we don't even know about and that are maybe looking really um, in close quarters and uh, it would be really good to figure out better ways in which we can make civilization resilient before those uh, risks hit, hit and not after. So there's a lot of, I think, um, yeah, a lot of urgency, a lot of importance. Um, and it's a very, very complex, uh, I think, a messy topic, but I'm super happy that we're talking about it today. Uh, specifically, um, we're going to start off uh, with David Mannheim, who's going to be presenting his chapter. Then we follow along uh, with Nell Watson, who will be presenting her chapter contribution. And finally, Roman um, and I will say a little bit about um, a few of the kind of like backstories um, that led to the creation of this book and uh, a few, um, let's say, um, future foreshadowings of why coordination is particularly important right now and what are big failure modes or big things to get right. So thank you so, so much for joining. Uh, with that, without further ado, I want to um, give the stage to uh, David Mannheim. David uh, has been on a faucet salon before on vaccine, on a specific vaccine proposal, which I share here, but uh, he is an independent researcher that is funded by uh, several different research grants. He's working with several universities and research groups across the board, focusing on biosecurity, very relevant right now, artificial intelligence alignment, uh, and looking at, uh, in those areas, both the technical issues, but also the public policy approaches. Uh, David is also a super forecaster with a Good Judgment, pro uh, uh, Good Judgment Inc. project, and uh, it was one of the really original super forecasters uh, involved in the um, in the project and uh, winner of the IRPAR competition uh, for forecasting. So I think that is probably like um, a big signal for many folks in this community uh, who kind of love and share his metaculous as well. So um, today I'm really, really happy, David, to have you here again, at this time discussing multi-party dynamics and failure modes for machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, it's a fantastic chapter, it's super accessible. I'll share it in here, please check it out. Um, this paper is basically building on the already known failure modes in AI systems, mostly in single systems, by providing additional potential failure modes that we have to be worried about, um, specifically for multi-agent systems. And um, I think one of the things that's fantastic about the chapter is that it uses a quite intuitive uh, example of uh, poker playing uh, in AI to, you know, to kind of like give an example of like um, where those failure modes may lie in multi-agent systems. And then it really kind of goes on to uh, like really um, create like a taxonomy almost uh, of different failure modes specifically for multi-agent systems, including accidental steering, coordination failures, adversarial misalignment, all the way to um, goal co-opting and, and, and even hacking. So I'm really happy, and David, to have you here to give a brief outline of the chapter. We won't do it justice in the time remaining, but um, at least it may entice some folks to dig deeper. All right, without further ado, uh, the stage is yours, David. Take it away. Thank you. It's uh, good to be back. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, so I, I kind of want to back up a couple of steps um, and talk a little bit about what people usually think of when they talk about multi-agent systems. Um, usually when people talk about multi-agent systems in AI or robotics, they're talking about a group of systems that are working together. Um, and there's a lot of really good work on kind of how it is that you train systems so that you can get independent agents to each do um, kind of part of what you want um, and get them kind of in combination with one another to accomplish a goal. Um, that's um, great if you start out with everybody coordinating. Um, the problem is that kind of the more general case, the one that we're worried about, um, is that 
lots of people are going to be developing AI um, as they already are. Um, and they're going to be putting those systems into the wild. Um, and with the systems in the wild, they will start interacting. And because they're not intended to cooperate, um, there's certainly no guarantee that they will. In fact, um, there are really good reasons that I kind of try and go into in the paper that we should expect them to do even worse than not cooperate. So the, the analogy that um, Allison pointed out was um, to poker. So there, there's a kind of, uh, I, I'm hoping most of you are at least basically familiar with poker. Um, but um, when a group of people are playing, um, it's not just a question of how much you want to bet based on your hand. It's a question of how much you want to bet based on your hand, given what you think about everyone else's hands. And then you see them bet and you respond to what they're doing, um, which means that um, you have to have a model of what it is that everybody else is thinking about. Now, Human brains are really well adapted to this. Um, mirror neurons, and there's, there's kind of, our brains are really um, specifically intended to do this well, understand what other people are doing. Um, but implicit in any kind of multi-player um, system, when you make a decision, you have some model of what it is that the other players are doing. Um, this is true even when you start talking about really simple uh, systems that do things like automated trading um, on Wall Street, where if you have a system kind of doing automated trading, it's implicitly making assumptions about how everybody else is going to react. So this is kind of the, the fundamental dynamics of what it looks like to make decisions when multiple people are involved. Um, the problem is that um, the way that people do this is really heavily constrained. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, we know what other human minds do. We have a lot of insight into uh, when you're playing poker, you have some idea that people doing things that make them seem nervous are likely to be indications that they're nervous. Um, and you have a good idea of what those are. You can kind of uh, intuit what it is that's happening in other people's heads based on that. Um, AI systems are much more general, much less transparent, and it's gonna be a lot harder for us to know what it is that's um, going on in their, um, so to speak, brains. Um, so given all of that, the question is, what happens when they start interacting? And the first indication that we have about this is what already is happening when um, these multi-agent systems interact. Um, and we see that starting to happen. When, when I started writing the paper, I was like, this seems like the kind of thing that's going to come up. Like this is definitely um, something that we should worry about where when these um, systems start interacting, we'll see um, some kind of strange behaviors um, that will have them fail differently than single agent systems fail. And as I was doing the research for the paper, I realized that this isn't a future phenomenon. Um, we see this happening now. Uh, high frequency trading is rife with um, all sorts of, um, let's say bad behaviors, uh, many of which if they were human would be massively illegal. Um, front running, um, and intentionally deceptive trading. Um, there's, there's a bunch of stuff that, that you're not allowed to do legally um, if you're a human. And in theory, uh, these systems aren't allowed to do it either, except that there's no clear, clear way to monitor them or understand what it is that's uh, happening inside of the systems. So when a computer system puts in an order for um, a half million shares, you don't know that that's because they have advanced warning that somebody somewhere else put in an order for a half million shares at a slightly higher price. And you're in the middle of, you know, the, the computer system is, is doing arbitrage to um, front run the, the trade. Um, 
So we see some of these behaviors. Uh, and the worrying thing about this is we don't have a really good way of understanding what types of things these systems could be doing to manipulate each other. Um, the goal of the paper was kind of to, to introduce some of the ways in which systems might uh, do this. So I think to, to kind of go at it backwards, the most obvious way for systems to interact in ways that are unacceptable um, is for them to directly interfere with one another. Um, if you have a uh, AI system that has access to the internet um, and it is let's say trading on Wall Street with a bunch of other systems that are also on the internet, then if one of the systems is able to directly crash the server of one of the other systems, um, it, it's going to be able to change the behavior of that system. Um, a more sophisticated version of this obviously is, um, and this would require much more complex AI than we currently have, um, though it's unclear exactly how long it takes to get there, um, is uh, hacking into the other systems, directly modifying them, doing all sorts of things that would um, actually kind of undermine the other system directly. Um, and, and that's something that I think people have been aware of, that if your um, AI system is unsafe, that if it can be hacked, then it's unsafe because it can be hacked. And that's not specific to um, multi-AI systems. Um, but it is something that we should expect in that type of system. Um, things that are more specific to multi-AI systems are ones that relate to um, goal hacking and um, manipulating the models of other agents via behavior. Um, so one of the, one of the um, things that was noticed pretty early on in high-frequency trading is that... Um, high frequency trading systems looked for trade activity. Um, and when they saw lots of buy orders, they would say, look, the price is going up. And if the price is going up, then they should buy um, and manage to make money off of that. The problem is that one of the things that you can do when, you, um, when, when you're interacting with the trading system is put in lots of orders and then cancel them before they're filled. Um, and this is um, something that, um, a lot of regulators have said, well, obviously, if it's intentionally deceptive trading, that would be illegal, but we don't know that it's intentionally deceptive trading. Um, it's, you know, you're not allowed to put in orders um, that aren't intended to be filled, but we don't know what the, uh, the system is doing specifically. It wasn't programmed specifically to do this. It's just observed that this works. Um, or the people who programmed it uh, put this in and um, said that they're not actually intending to do it as deceptive trading. They're intending to have the orders filled, but the program changes its mind in the middle. Um, this is really hard to regulate. Um, and the reason why I think this is more generally concerning is because it points to the fact that we have very little insight into what it is that's happening when the systems are behaving badly um, in these ways, in, in ways that we can kind of clearly identify and um, kind of formally describe. And even though we know exactly what it is that we would be looking for, it's unclear how it is that we would find that it's happening. Um, so I, I think that the kind of general um, point that I'd like to make is um, we see this happening now with some systems as more AI systems come online um, in different domains. We will see it there as well. Um, it's certainly more concerning if the AI systems are explicitly intended to um, attack one another. So um, cyber intrusion systems using AI are very worrying for, uh, because of things like this. Um, and we're not clear on how it is that we would find or prevent it. Um, and this is the, a much more general problem um, of 
trying to get AI systems to do what we want them to. Um, but the difficulty is much, much greater um, when you have these systems interacting in this way. Um, so I think that that kind of gives the background for what it is that um, I, I wanted to say. I'd be really interested in hearing if people have questions or observations about, about that. All right, this is a good time to ask a question in the chat right now, either preface it with a cue or raise your hand. Uh, as you speak, you can either do that by literally raising your hand in the video or preferably because it's easier to monitor by using the icon that you can see. There's a Zoom feature that should allow you to do this as well. Feel free to ask away. Uh, I'd be uh, really curious to see, um, you know, were there any additional uh, games that you were considering uh, uh, in, uh, instead of poker? Like, um, so it's interesting. The the there are two sides to coming up with a clear example of this, and a, a little bit of further research went into trying to find um, examples of systems where we could simulate this explicitly. So one of the things, one of the next steps for um, research in this is to show that this is occurring um, in kind of a model system. So you train one system to, um, uh, let's say, play a game, um, a multiplayer a game of some sort, and then um, you let the other um, AI systems uh, train with knowledge of what the first one does and watch that the second systems will inevitably figure out how to exploit the first one. Um, and um, so there are, there are a lot of kind of small and simple online games that would be useful for showing this. Um, and the biggest challenge that, uh, that I've had so far is that, um, as I kind of alluded to, I don't know how it is that we can detect that um, one or the other of these is happening. Um, if two people are playing chess and one of them wins, um, that's because they played chess better. Um, maybe the reason that they managed to play chess better is because they knew that the other player was expecting them to do something um, and they tricked it into responding to that. Um, Poker is a game that's all about this, um, and people have an intuition about how that works. Um, most other games are, I think in many ways, less um, uh, kind of mental interaction with other players um, in ways that are easy to um, intuit. Uh, not that it doesn't happen, but it's not as clear an example, and the systems that I have looked at it's unclear how you would how you would say yes, this is what's happening in that system. Okay, and I think you mentioned uh, you know like there are a few ways in which further research may help uh, elucidate that problem a little more. Could you be more specific if you were kind of like pointing people like, hey, you know, if anyone had time on their hand, what what kind of fields would you like to uh, to have investigated now? So I, I think that the the um, the first thing I would suggest is um, what, what the paper does is list what seems to be a comprehensive list of ways in which at least um, two agents can uh, interact and um, corrupt the other one's uh, goals. Um, and this is based on an earlier project on um, categorizing all of the failure modes um, based on Goodhart's law, if people are familiar with that, with that which is that um, if a um, if a system is being uh, controlled um, via a metric, um, let's say you reward teachers based on the metric of how well their students perform on tests, um, the test scores will stop representing what it is you want them to because um, teachers, as good intentioned as most of them are, um, will start teaching to the test. Um, less good intention teachers might do things like change students' answers on tests, um, which we've seen happen a lot of places, um, but directly kind of breaking the system. Uh, so we know that this happens kind of in, in this is almost the one person analog um, where, you have, um, where you have this type of interaction. 
we have a good theoretical understanding of all of the different ways that happens. Um, the categorization that I have is less, um, is less clearly defined. And I think that the mathematical side of this would be to um, kind of more formally define what is and isn't um, included in each of these. Um, and I, I've done a little bit of work on this and haven't gotten very far. Um, and I've talked to a number of people who um, have more background than I do in working with this. And they've said that they don't see an obvious way to attack it either. Um, the other thing that I think would be really valuable is actually building systems and simulating it and showing that, it, you know, what it is that happens and figuring out how to dissect it. So I think that those two things would be really, really valuable. Yeah, and then probably also having humans play those systems so we get like, because it's, I think, you know, one thing that uh, when we play with other humans, uh, there's at least an understanding that we share because we've had played so many iterated games before in a social context, there's at least like a kind of like shared understanding, but that obviously doesn't exist with AIs, right? So I think yeah. it would be just to get a better intuitive understanding of like how, uh, kind of like, you know, how, how, yeah, what, what we may be in, uh, what we may be in for on the long run, it would be like good to have maybe like humans and, and AIs play a little bit in that way. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, that that's right. I think that having better intuition would be great. I'm not sure that, um, uh, I'm hoping that we can do more than just build humans' intuitions for the fact that AI can do bad things. Um, it would be really useful if people were more aware that, um, AI systems aren't magic and won't um, and won't do the right thing just because they're um, just because they're computers. Um, there's kind of this this idea that a lot of people have that I'm sure Nell will talk um, about to some extent that um, you know smarter systems will be more moral and there's no reason to think that that's going to be true. Um, so yeah, we we should be worried about it. Okay, before we switch to now, my final question would be, uh, you've mentioned that like uh, you highlighted a few kind of like failure modes that are not uh, that are not really in store for a single agent system so much. Are there any kind of avenues for uh, upsides, uh, so for cooperation that uh, are available that, that you've kind of came across where you're like, oh, actually, you know, by having multi-agent systems, uh, we may be able to do much better at X. Um, I, I think that there's um, some really interesting work on um, provable verification. So um, when a human says, I really promise that I'm not bluffing this time, I have a great hand. Um, we don't know what that means. Um, with computer systems, there are places where um, you can do things like reveal source code and prove that certain behaviors are honest signals. Um, you can pre-commit um, in code in ways that humans can't. Um, so there are places where um, computer-based systems could be more trustworthy and better at coordinating. Um, actually designing them so that they're successful at doing that is tricky um, and is an ongoing area of research. I know that um, uh, Miri is, is doing some work on um, kind of provability of trustworthiness um, that relates to this type of this type of question. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, I'll leave it at that, and in, maybe we we have more time to come back to that uh, at the at the end. So if people, oh, wait, actually, uh, we have one more question uh, by Brian Muhia. I'll, I'll unmute you now, and then then I hand it over to uh, to Nell. Uh, okay, Brian, here you go. Um. Hi. So uh, my question is to is about um, uh, agent-based simulations. So, uh, like uh, we know <coughs> that for agent-based simulations to work better, we need to have some kind of source data on people's behavior or, or like a or or behavior of some kind of system. So, like how how would taking uh, uh, say uh, I guess the a system like uh, like maybe like a, a real-time chart system or something, and using using uh, debates of, of, or examples of debates to figure out whether people follow certain incentives in order to uh, and uh, through following those incentives, revealing the uh, good heart law or the kind of good heart law uh, that you'd like to demonstrate. Um, 
would that be like uh, in a formal like communication form or like, would it be better to just do it as a, as a thing that is non-interactive? Um, and how, how, do, how do it work to actually build something like that? Like, do you have the resources to do that? Um, so if I understand correctly, the, the, um, the question is kind of how would you show that this is what's actually happening um, when, when there are failures? And, and I think that it's at least clear that if you put one of these systems together and um, you see something that's um, implausible to be intentional behavior on the part of one of the um, agents, that it's because of something that happened um, some type of manipulation or failure. Um, and the question is, how do you figure out what failure it is um, or how it is that the system was exploited? Um, there, the, the, um, the hope is that um, some systems have metrics that are clear enough that you can um, watch what it is that the simpler systems are doing to see if they are being exploited. Um, the more general case, I'm very uncertain about. Um, I think that this is worth highlighting, not because there's a really interesting formal approach to fixing it, but because there's very little work on trying to do so. Um, and I think it's an area that um, would do well to have a lot of um, kind of fundamental research to improve what it is that we understand because um, as far as I can tell, there, there are some almost fundamentally intractable parts of this, um, which is very worrying because AI is in fact getting deployed. Um, a follow-up is, uh, so in, if you wanted to look at, um, I guess, human, human, human interactions and see whether uh, you can find out whether those kinds of problems can prop up and see whether in, like, maybe in, in like, like public chat forums, it's possible to find out that whether things like that are happening. Like, is it possible to actually detect it? Like, like, like you could actually it's possible to look at the like a chat log or something and see like I mean, was it or uh. there, there's a simple I, I think there's a simpler place where we certainly see this, which is um, kind of we, we watch human interactions that are intended to do this um, all over the place. And and the most recent example that I can think of that's um, timely, though switching back to our old topic, is um, when President Trump said that he didn't want to let the boat dock and let the people off because then the numbers would go up. Because early in the pandemic, if people came off of a boat and um, showed up in uh, the United States, the U.S.'s numbers would increase. Um, and this is a very clear and transparent attempt to manipulate a metric so that things look better. Um, and um, if the public didn't realize that this is what he was intending, then that would be a big problem. And if you look at the public debate, lots of people didn't. The, the, the public debate was not, okay, but these numbers are in fact part of the US's total. The fact that he made a decision not to let them dock doesn't change that. The, decision, the, the discussion was, oh, well, the numbers are here. And also there's this ship somewhere. Um, there are clear examples that this happens all of the time in human, human interactions when there are metrics involved. Um, I'm not sure that there's a lot of gain in trying to show that it happens in um, kind of in, in kind of analysis of conversation um, at a low level, just because I think that it's so obvious um, that it does happen. And I think it's not particularly tractable to figure out what it is that's happening in a complicated system like human discussion. All right, thank you so, so much. Uh, I posted one link which was pointed out by Jeremy on the topic that uh, we just touched, the, the earlier question on verification and you know whether uh, it's possible for uh, multi-agent systems to be more cooperative uh, and, and in which ways they can cooperate uh, perhaps uh, perhaps even better than humans uh, can. Uh, so check out that link. It was a previous post at Salon on Agoric. Uh, and for now, I want to give uh, the stage to Nell. Thank you so, so much, David. Uh, that was I know that the, the paper is, is really quite amazing. It's, it's very intuitive. It's, it's super easy to read. Um, I posted the link up to the paper on here. I encourage you uh, to check out the chapter. And for now, we'll be kind of zooming out all the way uh, to super, super moral AI. And I'm really, really happy to be joined 
uh, by Nell Watson here. Nell is a machine intelligence researcher who helped really to pioneer the uh, deep machine vision through her company QuantaCorp. And uh, really, uh, QuantaCorp enables fast and accurate body measurements from just really two photos. Uh, and you know, she shared her knowledge in a variety of different channels. Uh, Inter Alia, the AI faculty at the Singularity University. Um, she has also launched a really fantastic uh, kind of like community on EthicsNet, uh, which uh, I'm advising. And um, it is uh, kind of like steered at um, producing pro-social behaviors and machines and has done a variety of different research across the board on, in AI ethics. And I think i um, super excited about uh, her kind of presentation today. It's kind of taking the opposite approach of what many people usually worry about, which is that, you know, what would happen if uh, AIs actually became super moral in a where um, so what, you, we, what we usually tend to worry about is what if an AI is suboptimal by uh, human standards and the way that it's maligned and uh, executes something uh, that is actually not in, in our best interest. And she more worries about the flip side of that, what is uh, if an AI um, uh, became super moral um, and isn't constrained by, let's say, human biases uh, in ways that uh, it may judge a, a, a humans actually to be uh, ethically suboptimal in ways that, uh, that that becomes problematic for humans. So I'm uh, really, uh, really, really happy to welcome Nell here with her presentation. Uh, and I already welcome you to please collect questions in the chat so we can get onto them right away um, so we can make sure that uh, many of you uh, get heard in the Q&A. All right, uh, Nell, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Alison. Yes, I've, I've been quite engaged in the process of AI value alignment for a number of years, but I sometimes wonder if human alignment might be the more difficult question. Throughout human history, we have seen the emergence of uh, spiritual and philosophical leaders who have come to the fore with some kind of new moral wisdom and generally that tends to diffuse over time into the population. And I think it's, it's fair to say that over the centuries or over the millennia, general human morality has more or less improved. We've gotten better at being uh, more consistently moral and uh, including more people within the, the moral sphere of concern. Although of course we have a long way to go yet. We've also seen philosophers emerge who have come up with new ways of defining what is the good, whether that is Kant with the, the categorical imperative and deontological and you must always do the right thing, or whether it's something a little more flexible, such as Bentham's uh, utilitarianism and um, trying to strive to, to do the utmost good for the utmost people, even if some people have to suffer for that to happen. And I don't think that any of these models are perfect, but perhaps they uncover a portion of a greater truth. In recent years, with the emergence of machine intelligence, we have seen new capabilities emerge. For example, AlphaGo, playing a very, very difficult game for computers, Go, was able to create new stratagems that essentially no human mind had ever conceived of, and which appeared to be lunacy until the machine played those stratagems and won. And that brings me to thinking about morality. Might it be possible for machines to discover or to generate a more sophisticated form of morality? Perhaps, for example, machines may uncover some connection between thermodynamics and ethics. Or perhaps they may syncretize between a number of different potential ethical models in order to create something which is far more sophisticated than our typical human level of morality or the level of morality which is typically agreed upon in our human societies. Beyond mere ethical theories, we also have slightly different ways of understanding ethical problems. For example, uh, Lawrence Kohlberg's uh, levels of, of morality. Maybe I can, I can share my screen to make this a bit easier for everyone. Tell me if this is working, yes? Excellent. 
So here we have Kohlberg's model of morality. He reckoned there were six layers or levels of morality. Some people think there might be more. There are also critiques of this model. But I find it an, an interesting thing to, to consider. It's this idea that throughout our lives, as we develop, as we get more experience, we get more sophisticated at making sense of moral dilemmas. We start thinking about other people and we start internalizing external rules, whether those are laws, whether those are taboos and prohibitions. And perhaps as we get a little more experienced and sophisticated in our way of making sense of the world, with a little more wisdom under our belt, we can start to think in, in more sophisticated and more universalizable ways, thinking about um, essentially that, that something may, may or may not be right or wrong in a given situation, but that there is some universal or underlying principle which makes it important, even if in that instance it may not be. And so not all human beings, or at least not all humans at all stages in their lives, are able to reason about things in the same way. Now, there's, there's no right or wrong way of, of coming to, uh, of, there's no right or wrong answer to how these levels of moral development function, but it's rather about the principles behind one's reasoning and essentially how sapient they are or, or how um, non-egoistic they are. And so perhaps machines may be able to reason about morality in ways that are also beyond the ken of most human beings, right? Not all humans manage to get up to the fifth or sixth level of, of moral reasoning before they croak. And quite honestly, a lot of our moral reasoning is ex post facto justifications for things that our subconscious threw up at us anyway. But perhaps machines might help to act as an ubermensch, a, a form of generating new values for our society. And some people may adopt that. They may think of it as, as a kind of a, a Promethean fire that suddenly illuminates all of, their, all of their fuzzy thinking. And they will grok it. But also a great deal of people will not and they will not be able to perceive that form of moral reasoning, or they may find it so alien and so distasteful that they find it an abomination. It is, it is too different from whatever they had um, internalized before. And so my fear is that that could potentially create a kind of a, a civil war situation on a global scale, perhaps something akin to a Protestant Reformation whereby some people desperately want reform to happen and others desperately do not. And historically, we've seen some pretty ugly examples of that. And potentially, this is something that, that machines may bring to our door and oblige us to face. Because I observe that akin to Clark's maxim, that a sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, that also a sufficiently benevolent action may be indistinguishable from malevolent. Or perhaps even con conversely, a sufficiently malevolent action may be indistinguishable from a benevolent one. It is possible to kill people with kindness. And if you happen to be much smarter than people, then, then they may not recognize that you are indeed killing them with kindness. Or, you yourself may realize that your dog should not eat a chocolate bar. Chocolate is not good for dogs. But the dog doesn't understand that, and it thinks that you are being frustrating and mean when you deny it the access to the chocolate bar. And so this also presents another conundrum, whereby humans may not understand why machines are trying to direct them to a certain course, 
or why a machine forbids them from doing something, or why perhaps a machine forbids them from uh, treating other um, sentient creatures in horrible ways. And this could also lead to, to a schism in society, perhaps even worse than one where, where we simply have amoral machines. Because we know what amoral looks like. A small proportion of our population, somewhere between two to 4%, um, are essentially psychopathic or sociopathic. And we have developed ways in our society for dealing with that, usually after the fact, but they work relatively well. Um, and assuming, you know, your, your sociopath is, is not um, yet super intelligent, we can probably deal with that. But what we cannot understand or what we cannot foresee is what would it be like if you had a super intelligent creature or even a creature you know, approximately as intelligent as a human being, but had a much more sophisticated version of morality. We could not understand how to police that or even necessarily if we should. And so that's why I believe that supermoral intelligence may in fact be a far greater conundrum for humanity to deal with than mere amoral, simple um, reinforcement learners turning everything into paperclips per se. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nell. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have a, a, a gazillion questions uh, to that. Um, I think, uh, yeah, you're getting a, like a little, uh, a few claps already here, but, um, you know, so on the one hand, I wonder, like, so I know that I think it's a judgmental uh, bootstrapping, um, or there, there is a way in forecasting, and David, you would probably be able to, uh, to, uh, to kind of like, um, to object to this. I think there's a way in which you could improve on experts' prediction by uh, predicting in a more consistent way that they could. Uh, so if they weren't, uh, if they were actually following their predictions, or if they were following, if they were coherent with uh, with, with previous predictions, they would predict sometimes a certain way, and they actually do because of their biases about a certain topic or something. What's that called, David? Um, yeah, aggregation and um, super forecasting definitely found that that's um, kind of exactly what works is um, you can extremize people's predictions because you know that they're kind of in specific ways um, biased. You can discount um, people who have a history of being more biased in certain ways. There's a lot that you can do to uh, improve people's uh, predictions kind of on the basis of the fact that you know that they're not very good at predicting. Yeah, so I wonder, like, that's one way, you know, that an AI can at least, like, get, get better, I guess, than, than humans, and you can do the same, you know, like, I mean, for moral, for moral cases, right, where an AI is just much more consistently uh, applying, like, any type of, like, heuristic that we, we, may, we may be applying, and, uh, like, I think you mentioned the case of veganism <laughs> in the chat, David, so that's one, perhaps, where we're just biased uh, in, in ways that an AI will point out to us. And, you know, I always wonder, like, how far, like, if there's su such a thing as moral progress, how far could an AI advance to still be legible, legible, legible to us as kind of actually advancing us on, uh, kind of like, on, on given our, and, and actually doing something that is more, that would be more coherent given our, uh, our already existing values, or when would it race so far ahead that it actually, that it actually seems uh, immoral? Do you have any specific examples for that now? Yes, I mean, certainly things, things such as um, how we treat other, other life on this planet, or even how we treat the planet itself, or how we stick our head in the sands with regards to externalities and shifted costs. Uh, there are so many opportunities that um, even, even our limited human minds can foresee that a, a more sophisticated um, moral guide may be able to lead us towards something more universalizable, something less supremacist, um, something which expands the moral sphere to include more beings within it. However, beyond that might be, might be trickier. Um, our our super moral AI may consider reinforcement learners to have their own um, moral uh, worth, perhaps. And that, that may make some of our AI technologies untenable in such a moral system. 
um, because we would be, be, be being cruel to these uh, reinforcement learners. Um, those are not in our moral sphere at all, um, but perhaps they should be, who knows? And only a more sophisticated moral uh, and intellectual intelligence could truly tell us either way. And do you have any uh, idea like, or any comments to value drift and how that plays into supermoral AI? The idea that our, our values are yeah, okay. I, I'm ahead. posting a, I'm posting a, I, I'm just saying I'm posting a, uh, like a little note on value drift in here if people want to read up on it, but uh, I think you're already, uh, you're familiar with it. Oh, why don't, why don't you explain it then? Um, all right, so basically it's uh, by Hansen, uh, it's a Hansonian concept, I think, or at least he's written about it like quite eloquently uh, in the sense that, you know, our values drift a lot over time. They've certainly uh, drifted a lot uh, until now, and they may drift a lot uh, re really in the future. And it is kind of like, uh, it is very hard to pinpoint um, depending on different factors, such as uh, inertia, growth, competition, uh, influence drift, internal drift, culture drift, and context, our values may drift uh, actually a lot. So uh, I wonder, when do you think, uh, when, how can we, where is there a point from which we can evaluate whether an AI is now super moral, and that's, uh, and, uh, uh, and that's why it differs significantly from our values, or whether it just drifted significantly in, uh, you know, like almost like an amoral sense, uh, and, and which is more a paperclip drive Rather than, rather than something super moral. You know, from our, for, for all we know, you know, maybe a paperclip is the ultimate uh, moral thing to do. And like, it's really hard from our perspective to even determine whether it's now super moral or whether it's a paperclip. That is true. Um, certainly, we, we've seen a lot of, a lot of moral drift in, in recent years, uh, a tremendous amount of moral drift, as well as a, uh, in, an increasing polarization within society and um, more people delving ever stronger into their own ideological camps, which I, I find terribly unfortunate. And I'm trying to create some meta rules around that at culturalpeace.org. But equally, AIs, if they are reliant on, on data, which may be somewhat out of date, that may itself cause a drift. So um, sometimes systems are designed with certain assumptions in mind, or with certain reference data, which quickly uh, grows out of, um, out of touch with current social reality. For example, a lot of our databases, even in use today, especially government databases and banking databases, they made an assumption that a doctor had to be a male, or they made an assumption that people's gender would never change, or these kinds of things, which, which make uh, working with these kinds of established data structures very difficult. And perhaps we see some, some other kinds of value drifts as well in not having a good data set or a, a, a forward looking enough data set for machines to match humans on, the, on those impressions. All right. Thank you so much. Again, we're barely scratching the surface. I mean, this is a problem that philosophers have been tackling for quite a while. Um, thank you so, so much for giving this really amazing uh, outlook into, uh, into your paper. I encourage everyone to uh, check it out. Um, I, I can repost uh, the link to the book, but I think by now, uh, I, I think I've done that a few times so people know, how, know where to find it. Um, all right, so I think we tackled kind of like a super kind of like, let's say, um, near-term um, dynamical, uh, near-term dynamics that are already prevalent in poker, in poker playing human agents, uh, and you know, and how that could be extrapolated to, uh, to, um, to multi-agent dynamics. And then went all the way and zoomed out into thinking about, you know, kind of like future normative questions that uh, are in, 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 in insanely slippery. Um, so thank you so, so much for kind of like covering the, 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 the near term and, and the very long time horizon here in, in just the short outline. Uh, I'm really, really happy uh, to have Roman here right now, um, who's managed to come hop on. It's always the thing. If you talk about AI or super intelligence in any channel, that usually comes with a technical glitch. I don't know why that is almost a rule, but it just ha happens to be that way. Anyway, I'm really happy to have you here, Roman. Uh, I, I have already, and I think you may have already been on the call, but um, uh, but uh, but um, with your phone number, I've already alluded to the fact of how uh, honored I was to meet you at an, at our previous AGI meeting. Um, but how honored I was to have you as a Foresight Fellow, and then how honored I was that you reached out to me to co-edit. Um, 
hit this special issue that then turned into a journal together. Um, you know, you've really done like the, the bulk of the work. So I'm super, super happy to have you here for a discussion. I made you co-host so you can unmute yourself whenever you'd like. Could you maybe just share uh, your kind of like initial thoughts on like, why do you even think that AI coordination and strategy, which is um, the focus uh, of the special edition and now book, uh, is a really, really important on the path to save super intelligence? Well, thanks a lot for waiting on me. I apologize for being late. I was actually 20 minutes early, but it took me an hour to get in with a password, which makes me think that it's possible to build secure software. I'm very optimistic now. Uh, yeah, I was on the phone, so I could hear wonderful presentations before me. Uh, what is coordination here? So AI is a global, global problem and global uh, technology. You cannot do anything in isolation. You cannot have safe Kentucky AI. You cannot have safe AI with just one company. Any type of regulation, any type of uh, controls we want to put in place have to be global or they don't mean anything. I think I really like the example of uh, during the pandemic, people talked about how it doesn't make sense to have local restrictions. It's like having a ping area in a pool, right? It's not helping overall safety of uh, participants, overall health will still suffer. So depending on what we're trying to do, it's uh, a mandatory requirement to have all the players, all the companies, all the countries on board participating uh, agreeing to the same standards, agreeing to uh, any legal uh, constraints we might put in place, whatever it is, moratoriums and certain type of uh, lethal weapons or something like that. And without it, it's uh, not enough to have successful technological solutions. So uh, we can talk about three separate domains here. We're talking about ethics, which is all the morals and super morals and what it is we're actually trying to accomplish. But then you have the technical aspect. If you cannot do the technical stuff, the other two are meaningless. The third one is uh, governance. Uh, you may have technological solution, you may have moral understanding, but if it's not widely implemented again, it doesn't work. So you have the three components which have to come together. Yeah, a few components, I think, you know, is, is really to say the least. And could you maybe foreshadow and, uh, you know, feel free to take the current uh, crisis, uh, you know, as a, I guess, as an example case, because I think it's really hard not to talk about it. And we, even in this context, what are like a few of the risks uh, if we get um, coordination, especially around AI wrong? Uh, and what are a few of the upsides if we actually make some headway around the problem? Well, I think overdoing it may be a problem. So if we put complete bans on AI, we just make AI development illegal, that means it's pushed out of hands of good guys, uh, people who would like to be in charge of that process, and uh, people who are willing to do illegal and ethical research. And that may be much more problematic. Uh, in terms of good outcomes, uh, if we have any examples from history of controlling technology, chemical weapons, biological weapons, that would be the best outcome where we all can agree on what we're trying to do and we're successful in implementing it. Maybe some other examples didn't work out as well, maybe nuclear weapons, uh, drug controlling, but it's, it's spread out, but uh, at least it's another tool in our toolbox to, to accomplish safety act. And are you, uh, in the current context, more or less hopeful that um, we will get our act together on AI coordination? Oh, I'm completely not optimistic at all. Yay, David, Nell, do you want to chime in? Any upsides, downsides for AI coordination? <laughs> I, I, would say, I would say that there's um, an outside view argument that says that um, people have um, almost always been worried that technology would be abused. Um, they've almost always been correct. And um, humanity has uh, reacted so far, and maybe this will be the time that we fail, but so far, despite the fact that people um, expect failure, um, they have managed to um, neither um, nuke ourselves out of existence, um, nor uh, kill each other in uh, um, kind of less drastic ways. Um, I think that the, uh, the, the line that is used about um, America is probably um, applicable here, which is uh, humanity um, always does the right thing after exhausting all of its other options. Um, 
hopefully that's true. Um, we'll see. I think there's, there's room for a little bit of cautious optimism. I observed that we've had many successes in coordinating and making good decisions. For example, uh, common law was essentially a, a genetic process of common sense over many generations. And it's generally speaking gotten better and more sophisticated and, and more able to deal with complex nuances over time. And yes, sometimes we need to, to refer back to some sort of atavistic element in order to, um, to reform something that hasn't gone quite right in how we do that process. But on the whole, I think it works and it's one of our most, our most commendable human inventions. And I think that we can do something similar with how we regulate machines, how we regulate the use of these technologies to make them harder to use for coercive or fraudulent purposes. And I think we have an opportunity to do that, although even if it seems uh, that coordination in these times is harder than ever. Thanks, Roman, do you want to chime in? Uh, sure, so we did survive, that's true, but if you study history, we always gonna barely survive. Like one person had to decide not to start nuclear war and then it had to happen again. Like we seriously had that exact situation twice where somebody went, I'm not gonna start a nuclear war. And uh, how, how many times are you gonna get lucky, right? We talked about poker, gambling, uh, you can only go all in so many times before it backfires. Historically, it was always about technology as a tool. So we were in charge, we had a chance to override whatever mechanisms. If AI is an agent and a smarter agent, that same uh, lack of a specific human will run out very quickly. So uh, I think it's important to be optimistic, but it's more important to be realistic. Right now, as far as I know, we don't have any specific working scalable safety mechanisms in place which can take us to that level we all find yeah thanks i mean you know given the fact you were like a faucet fellow on security and artificial general intelligence and it's definitely one of your specialties right that a computer security angle so i'd be really curious to uh, hear your thoughts on computer security and, and artificial intelligence and and how it's to strategy because that is something that like you know it seems is already at a point of potential risk, like it, in the in the in the ways in which it could fail our electric grid. But now also with everyone moving online, uh, it is a much more uh, kind of like near term worry that we could be getting good at, and that may actually provide a lot of uh, kind of like security also for more advanced agents that we build down the road. So I'd be really curious to hear kind of like your um your intro, your input on that. Right. So that's another angle of uh, concern, right? So we talk about making AI do what we want, designing it properly, but then we talk about malevolent agents who would like to take over AI at their own goals. So security becomes necessary, even if we know what we're doing, we're working on it, just securing the software from external agents, other governments, military, that in itself would be an additional challenge. And we know there is no such thing as secure, 100% secure software. We never succeeded at making anything unhackable or at least give it a little more time and then it becomes possible to uh, hack it. It may not happen right away, but given enough time, all software fails in that way. So that's another thing. And if uh, with alignment with uh, ethics, we have some ideas for how to move it forward, how to do things uh, with uh, internal uh, malevolent agents, for example, in cyber threats, we have no idea what can be done, if anything. So that's a well-known weakness, and uh, as far as I know, it, no one's publishing on it because there's nothing to publish uh, unless somebody wants to point to a citation I'm missing. I'd be very happy. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll post a link in the chat to uh, I think a talk that Christine once gave on computer security and the electric grid and like how uh, kind of like how close to the precipice uh, I guess like we we are on that one specifically. Um, I. There's also an, a really insane book uh, called Blackout. It was written by, I think, a German author on what can happen with a computer security attack on the electric grid. I think it is something that uh, we should be taking uh, 
um, seriously on the short term because if that uh, if that now happened in addition to kind of the existing uh, crisis that we already have, like let alone all of the kind of like chatbots and memes that would that is one that is kind of like immediately attacking physical infrastructure. And I think you're just like doing fantastic work in that area. So I'd be very very curious to uh, to hear your thoughts and. If we are trying to kind of like spin it a little bit on the, on a positive trajectory, um, what what kind of like research area do you think if people look at that more, you would be much more optimistic that we could actually get around uh, to a positive outcome on coordination? It seems like you're even uh, you're even pessimistic on the computer security end. I thought I could catch you there. Um, if it's not that one, what what is it? So I'm looking at comments. I see people talk about verification. I see examples of software given which may be bug free. With verification, we can do some good work making sure that the code we uh, developed actually matches what the intentions are for a model for it. But this only works for deterministic uh, software. You cannot uh, do verification for agents which keep learning in new domains reacting in new environments in unpredictable ways. We don't know how to verify such levels of behavior. Software which has been believed to be secure for 5, 10, 20 years, sometimes we discover a bug later. Same goes for mathematical proofs. There are examples and hundreds of them where a well-established proof with other proofs relying on it has been overturned. So uh, if we need to get unprecedented level of security, we need a 100% safe system. Because one bug is uh, final, right? It's not like credit cards. You get a new credit card number and you move on with your life. If there is one mistake and that leads to existential crisis, this is it. There is no undo button. So very different level of uh, requirements for AI safety versus just standard software security. In standard security, okay, you fail, somebody loses their job, somebody gets embarrassed, we move on with our life. In AI safety, if you're talking about super intelligence in particular, uh, we don't know if there is a second chance. It doesn't seem like it's likely. Yeah, I think David was pointing in the chat of like, well, if it's like five out of six that we survive, uh, that's good, but it's not really like we have a shot from which we can learn to do better uh, in the next one around. But Roman, I still haven't heard from you. Uh, the answer to the question of like when would you be more optimistic that we could get our, uh, uh, that we could get around to strat to coordination on AI and other uh, existential risks if you saw more effort in X. So again, I will try to avoid answering in a way you want me to answer. My latest research is all about impossibility results in AI safety, right? Talking about what can be done even in principle theoretically. So things like unpredictability of AI, we cannot predict what a smarter agent will do. Unexplainability. We cannot uh, have them explain what they are doing because of, again, complexity barriers. Incomprehensibility. Even if they explain it, we still not understand too many variables, too many factors, too many ways. We're talking about billions of factors in a decision. Uh, my work, uh, as of right now, current work, is about limits to control. There is a lot of research on control theory. Again, in deterministic environments, we're very good at control. If it's non-deterministic, if it's more complex than we are, uh, there are strict limits on what can be accomplished in there. So I'm not optimistic because of actual uh, latest theoretical results on it. We can all come together and agree that it's bad, but I'm not sure even global agreement allows us to steer future development of technology sufficiently. There is always malevolent players, uh, foreign actors who may violate any agreements just because it's so financially beneficial. We're talking about technology which is worth easily billions of dollars in physical cognitive labor. So I don't know if it's possible to have 100% of all humans in alignment that this is what we're doing and no one breaks rank. Any, uh, does Dunell and David want to say any final words on this? I'll just say, um... I think that there are certainly plausible futures in which um, AI alignment is, if not solved, at least um, obviated as a threat. Um, I won't say that I'm confident that we will reach any of them, but um, I certainly think that um, 
Roman would agree that working on the problem makes it more likely that we'll reach one of those futures than abandoning the problem and not working on it. Yes, and I'll lead by example. I'm definitely working on it, and I highly recommend my paper on personal universes where everyone gets a universe they like, and this way we will have to actually agree on anything. You know, I, I really like that, that personal universe idea. And I think maybe if we had a, had a personal value universe that we could put into machines, then they could much better understand who we are and where we're coming from. I observed that one very important aspect of being a pro-social agent is modeling the preferences of others and doing your best to meet those preferences. And so I think if, if machines better understood who we are and our values and our preferences, we would be more likely to have beneficial outcomes coming from machines. And also perhaps we might see something like a Google Translate between human values to help to find the ways in which humans are more similar and to translate across the ways in which we believe that we are different. Maybe that might bring more peace in the world. Okay, yeah, I like the. Can you share the paper on uh, on the universes, Roman? Please, uh, I would like to have uh, to request uh, a voluntary association of aligned uh, universes, whether they're more or, or others, so that you can like do a little like uh, sea setting uh, of your universes uh, according to uh, according to to like minds. Okay, before we get all the way overboard, <laughs> um, I would love to close it out. I would love to thank you so 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 much for joining. Uh, this was, I think, we, we tackled on a, a very wide, uh, wide, um, wide terrain today. Um, I would welcome you at uh, next week on Thursday. We're continuing this conversation with two new chapter, um, with two new chapter uh, proposals. Uh, one of uh, the chapters that a woman also co-authored. So I'm really, really excited about that. Um, take a look for the event right to be out uh, very soon. It's already on the Google Calendar. I'll share the Google Calendar here in the chat so you can add all of the uh, online salons to your calendar. So you, never, you never miss out on one. Uh, I'm really happy to uh, welcome, hopefully, Roman, you can maybe join as well and, uh, and give some more uh, optimistic, uplifting thoughts on the next one of those next week. <laughs> okay, this is glorious. Um, thank you so, so much for coming. I'm going to hand it over to Lou now for some social time. And uh, thank you so much. David, Nell, and Roman, that you were able to make it on such short notice. Um, yeah, I mean, like now it, it really only feels like we're warming up to a discussion about this, right? But I think if people read the chapters, if they're interested in talking more, maybe we can have another deep dive, more like a journal club, and when people have actually done uh, some of the readings and we can get in some of the nitty gritty of this. So I'm open to that if people are interested, let me know. And I hand it over to Lou. Thank you so, so much. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs>